feast. In every event that he went to, he was the supreme authority that was there. He was the master of the occasion, wherever he was. And we're going to cover two events that Jesus was at. One was a wedding in the city of Cana. And the other one is the Jewish Passover feast in Jerusalem. Both of them are in John's Gospel, chapter 2. In every event, Jesus somehow reveals who he is. Every time he was at any event, whether it was a dinner, whether it was a wedding, whether it was a feast, somehow when he was there, somehow he reveals his character, his ma that he is the master in authority over every event. We're going to go to the wedding that is in Cana where he was invited. He was invited and his disciples were invited. In John chapter 2, verse 1, it says, On the third day a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Dear woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied. My time has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jugs, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. This is the first of his miraculous signs Jesus performed at Cana in Galilee. He thus revealed his glory, and his disciples put their faith in him. Now, you, you got to realize, John wrote this gospel. He was there. He, he was an eyewitness to what took place. And you got to imagine that. So remember that John's intention here in writing the gospel was to record the miracles so we could believe them and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So to record the miracles of Jesus so we could believe and live. Now, we must believe that Jesus is the Son of God to have eternal life. One of the things that, that all the cults in the world deny, they, and this is what makes them all cults, this is what makes them all, you can put them all in one pot, is because they all deny that Jesus was God in flesh. See, if you don't believe Jesus is God in flesh, you ain't making it. You won't have eternal life. So all the cults in the world that got all their, their teaching, all their things, and they say they're the way, they're not the way. Jesus is the way. But all of them are anti-Christ because they don't believe in the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. But John wrote the gospel to reveal the, the character of Jesus so we can believe. Now at this wedding, Jesus turned water into wine. This was his very first miracle that he did. Now he's got disciples following him. They have never seen a miracle before. They were following him and obviously they thought he was somebody. They thought he was a prophet. They hoping that he might have been the Christ. But up until this time they really didn't you know they didn't know for sure. And a lot has been said about and preached about Jesus turning water into wine. But I want to stay in the vein of living in the supernatural. Weddings are a social event. Uh, 
It's a celebration. There's dancing. There's eating. There's a lot of celebration. I love, I love weddings. It's a joyous time with family and friends. Everybody's happy. Everything's going good. That's what was happening at this wedding. But something happened. There's something in the backgrounds happened. They ran out of wine. Now, whether this was a miscalculation by the people who were running the wedding or maybe it was all the family could afford. But the thing was is that they ran out of wine and either way it would have brought some humiliation to the bridegroom and the family. So what we see here, we see Mary, the mother of Jesus, maybe it seems to be, it doesn't say, but she had to have something to do with this wedding. Either she was related to the people or she had something to do with putting this thing together because when they ran out of wine, somehow she felt some responsibility to this thing. And really, because she took charge of it right away when she found out that she took charge of this thing. So what she does, she approaches Jesus, her son, and had words with him. Now, remember, if you're the disciples, you're standing there, you're listening to this conversation between Jesus and his mother. And his mother said to him, they have no more wine. He says... Dear woman, why are you involving me? We're just invited here. Jesus replied, my time has not yet come. But obviously, Mary, his mother, thought different. That this is your time. Okay? And Jesus was 30 years old at this time. He just started the ministry. It's, but I want to go back 30 years when his mother was a virgin, young woman, who by an angel by the name of Gabriel appears to her and tells her that she is going to conceive a child and bring forth the son. You remember that story? It's a Christmas story. Luke chapter 1 verse 34 and 35. She said, how will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Now, for 30 years, Mary is raising this son of hers for 30 years. She had pondered this in her heart that this child that was conceived in me, I don't know how. The angel said it was by the Holy Ghost, but I became pregnant. Now I raised this kid for 30 years. The angel said he's the son of God. So I guess she said to herself, if he is the son of God, then let's get something going here. <laughs> if you are the son of God, then... He said, my time hasn't come yet. No, your time has come. So Mary ordered the servants. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now, I want you to picture yourself with being a disciple. Listen to this. The mother's telling him, no, your time has come. Servants, do whatever he tells you to do. See, this is the secret of living in the supernatural. This is the secret. You want to know what the secret is? Just do what he tells you to do. And you will live a victorious life, a supernatural life. Just do what Jesus tells you to do. And you're going to see something happen. So, doing what Jesus is telling you to do... It's true Christianity, it's obeying the Lord. So how can we do what he says if we don't know what he says? Many professing Christians today are illiterate concerning this. 
You can't live the Christian life if you don't know what he says. You can't obey him as Lord if you don't know what he's commanding you to do. That's why soon, when our Wednesday night things are over, we're going to be getting life groups where we're going to meet in small groups. And guess what we're going to do? We're going to read and study the word so we can obey what the Lord is telling us to do. To read it and study it. It's the greatest thing we can do. It's the greatest thing we can do. Because you see, right here, there's a great commission here. Teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. Well, if, if they don't know what he's commanding us to do, we can't tell them to obey it. It's the greatest thing we can do. But what I found out at being a pastor and being a Christian for 48 years is that reading the word of God doesn't appeal to the natural man. You rather read something else. You want to read the word of God. It don't appeal to the natural man. It does. It, but doing what Jesus said, living like He says, say it, it's seeing the supernatural. All that really doesn't appeal to the natural man. The problem is, is that many professing Christians are not hearing the voice of the Lord. They're not even expecting Him to to speak. So how are you going to be led by the Lord if you don't even know he's talking? But Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. So if you're a believer, you should be hearing something from God. I had to get alone with God. My wife can tell you, it was two days in my office. I got to hear something. I got to preach Sunday. I said, Lord, if you don't speak to me, then I don't know what to do. Many times, uh, preaching for 40 years, I, you know, at the end of the week, I'm, I'm saying, God, what is it you want me to say? There were times I got down on my knees and, and I told God, listen, these are not my people. They're your people. If you want me to tell them something, then you better speak to me. I don't have anything to tell them. But God always comes through, and that's, uh, that's what he did. I, had, I was telling Pastor Joe, I had two other messages going. And, and halfway in it, spending hours doing it, that ain't it. I do another one, that ain't it. I said, what is it? But he finally got it to me. He finally downloaded it. After crying, he, he did it. But, but weddings and social events are... An opportunity, really, for service to witness for Jesus. I like going to weddings, uh, but I go to some w with unbelievers if I'm invited, but I don't stay long because after the wine starts flowing and the booze start going, you, you can't talk sense to nobody. Everybody's out of their minds. But the disciples were invited and, and because Mary and, and Jesus was invited. Mary was there. Jesus and the disciples were invited. And when we're invited to any, loca any occasion, we need to bring Jesus along with us. That's why we go. Everywhere you go, every event, every occasion, you need to bring Jesus with you. Things are going to happen when you do that. And, and, but let's examine this mir miracle for a second. How it happens brings some insight. This took place in a natural setting. Nothing supernatural about it. It was a common wedding. Now listen to this. Jesus didn't touch anything. He didn't touch nothing. He orchestrated everything. He didn't touch nothing. Wasn't, you know, when he said, why are you involved? He didn't get involved. He gave orders to the servants. Now who are the servants? Well, he really should be us. We are the servants. We should be listening to his voice telling us what to do. The servants need to hear his orders and follow him. That's what Christianity is all about. That's what this church is all about. Jesus didn't touch anything. There were six water jugs. Jesus told them, 
You see those water jugs over there? Just go fill them up with water. That's what they did. He just told them to fill them up. He didn't touch the jug. He didn't touch the water. The servants did. Then he told them, now go draw some of the water out and take it to the master of the banquet. The servants did the work. Jesus did the miracle. See, there's work here in this church for us to do. And we're going to work. We're going to do the work. And guess what? Jesus is going to do the miracle. You got family that needs to be saved. You got friends that need to be saved. When they come in here, as long as we're doing the work and preaching the gospel, then the miracle of their life is going to take place. We can't do it. We're just going to do the work. Jesus does the miracles. The servants did the work. So, let us do what Jesus is telling us to do. And I believe this church, we're not playing here. We're doing exactly what the Bible is telling us to do. When I want church members, we want to make disciples of everybody that gets in here. See, the master of the banquet tasted the wine. He didn't know where it came from. The servants did. See, the servants did. Like when we see miracles happen here, when people's lives get changed, I know where it comes from. Same place that changed my life is going to change their life. The servants knew. But then it says, then the master of the, of the, of the ceremony, then he called the bridegroom aside and said, listen up here. Everybody brings out the choice wine first. In other words, the best wine first, then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. But you have saved the best till now. I want to tell you something. The best is yet to come. I don't care where you're at in your Christian life. See, the Christian life doesn't get worse. It gets better. It gets better. I don't care if you're going through trials and tribulations. I don't care. When you steady on, the best is yet to come. The Lord is telling me about this church and ministry that he's called me here to pioneer. And we've been pioneering this thing. That, that. I've been in full-time ministry for 40 years. This is the fourth church I've pastored. I believe the Lord is telling me now the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. The best of the ministry that he's been giving me is going to happen right here. He saved the best to now, and I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying it. Living for Jesus never gets old. It just gets better. See, two things happen as a result of the miracle that Jesus did at the wedding. Two things. He revealed his glory and his disciples put their faith in him. Imagine this. Now imagine being one of those disciples. And John wrote it. He was there. They're all standing around. They had never seen nothing happen. But they're watching the discussion with Jesus and his mother. And he tells the servants, go fill up. You can imagine standing there watching this. He's telling the servants, go fill up those water jugs. What in the world is he going to do? Fill it up. Now take some out and go bring it to the master. That's all he saw. Until they heard the master say, why did you say the best to last? See? And because of that, the scripture says the disciples put their faith in him. Whoa, did you see that? Did you see that? He poured water in there and when it came out, it was wine. That's why John wrote the gospel, so we could believe. The next scene 
is in chapter 2. It's right after this. After they finished the wedding, they're heading to Jerusalem now to go to the Passover feast, the Jewish Passover feast. Let's read that. John chapter 2, verse 12. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and brothers and his disciples, the whole gang. There they stayed for a few days, and when it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found men selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple area, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? His disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. Then the Jews demanded of him, what miraculous sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. The Jews replied, it has taken 40 years to build this temple and you're going to raise it in three days. But the temple he had spoken of was his body after he was raised from the dead. His disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scriptures and the words that Jesus had spoken. It wasn't until after Jesus was resurrected from the dead that his disciples, what he's saying that his disciples didn't even know what he was talking about until he was crucified, buried, and rose again on the third day. They remember, that's what he told those people. See, when Jesus walked into the temple courts and saw what was going on, the selling of animals, exchanging money in the temple, I love this part here that John records. The other gospels don't record that. But he made a whip. Now, he took that whip and he went in there and he began to drive out all these people out of the temple, both the merchants, the animals, turning over money tables. You look like a maniac. Let me tell you, this wasn't some feminine Jesus that you see in the movies and in pictures where he's got his little robe on and he's so tender. That ain't him. That ain't the one I want to follow. The one I want to follow is the one who made the whip and went in there and ran everybody out. That's the guy I want to be behind. See, he looks like a man's man to me. Somebody who's not afraid to stand up to what is right. I'm going to say that to every man here. He's stand up for what is right. What is right in God's eyes? What is right in your family? What is right at your job? What is right? You need to stand up. Be a man. This was the son of God. The, the holy one of Israel. That's who he was. It wasn't nothing else. There was not just a few merchants. There were a lot of them. There were a lot of people. There were thousands of people there. That he did this. He told them, get these out of here. How do you dare turn my father's house into a market? See, that temple area was a place of prayer, just like we had here today. The place of prayer. This is what, it, what it's all about. They turned it into a marketplace. A worldly place of merchandising. Now, you're going to say, well, Pastor, what, what in the world does all this have to do with us? I'm glad you asked the question. Because it tells us. 1 Corinthians 3.16 says, Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him for God's temple is sacred and you are that temple. 
See, Jesus wants the temple clean. See, God doesn't live in church buildings. Look, we did the best we could with this dump that we leased here. <laughs> but God doesn't live here because we did all this work. He lives here because we are here. Wherever we come together, he said he's going to be there. Whether it's here or wherever, it, wherever it's at. God doesn't live in church buildings. Of course, some people think they do. But he dwells in every born again believer. We are God's temple. And what is really going on inside of this temple is what he's concerned with. Have we filled our temple with the merchandise of the world like they did? They did, all, they did all their business in there, all their making money inside the church. There's a story, I don't know whether I ought to tell this or not, but there's a friend of mine when I first was saved. I was trying to get him. He was in Catholicism, and I was trying to get him to come to church to get saved. And he said, well, I'll go to your church, you go to mine. I said, okay. Well, he came to to church with me. The next Sunday I went with him. But when we were walking in, they had a big container outside the doors. They were selling wine for $3 a bottle. I said, you want to buy a bottle before we go in? <laughs> he got mad at me, but he knew what I was talking about. This is not a merchandise place here. We don't even hardly ask for money here. You just need to tithe and give and support. We don't, we're not going to tell you anything about that. You need to do that. But have our hearts, the temple that, that we are, the Holy Ghost, has it been consumed with the things of the world? Have we brought those things in? Is our relationship with, with Christ first priority or is there any all other things in here? See, they turned that, that temple in Jerusalem into a marketplace. There was nobody praying. How are you going to pray? They got animals in there. They got all kind of stuff in there. How are you going to pray? They changing money. They doing business. How is anybody going? That was, a, that was an area where people needed to be shouting to God. But they turned it into something else. Jesus did it. He went in with a whip. He did it. He cleaned that place out. Why? Because he had the power and authority to do it. They asked him, who gave you this authority? I like in one gospel where, where they asked him that. He said, well, I'll answer that question if you answer one for me. John the Baptist, his, his baptism, was that from heaven or was it from earth? Was it from God or was it from man? They huddled to the side and said, well, let's see. If we tell him that it was from God, they're going to say, well, why didn't you get down in the water and get baptized? If we say it's from man that John made that up, the people know John's a prophet. They're going to stone us. So they went back and told him, we don't know. We don't know. You say, well, I ain't telling you how I cleanse this temple. I ain't going to tell you where the authority came from that I cleaned this temple out. You see, the power of the Holy Spirit and the authority of the blood of Jesus Christ is what cleanses this temple. See, see, it was poured out. The blood was poured out. The Holy Spirit was given. Our temples need to be clean to live supernaturally. If you're going to live supernaturally, you've got to get clean. you got to get clean. And the power comes from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes believing on Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And if we want to live the supernatural life, we need the power. Jesus promised the power. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he says, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You know what that means? That means the north shore, south shore, 
everything to the east of us, everything to the west of us, we're going to be witnesses. We're going to be witnesses to our friends, our family, our neighbors. But I want to conclude with this. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, it says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You know what that means? That means he is the master of your past. He's the master of your present. And he's the master of your future. If you're here today and he hasn't taken care of your past, he's the master. He can do it today. Today. It can happen today. Now, if you're saying, hey, I, I'm, I'm not in a good shape now. The present. Well, he can take care of the present because he's the same. He's the master of your life now. He can take care of the past. He can take care of now. And he can be the master of your future. I like that. I ain't got to worry about tomorrow. He's got that. See, he's got that. So if you're here today, I want everybody to stand with me.